my name is Jeremy Mosher, and I'm a board member with the Canadian Business History Association, and I'll be moderating today's session. The Canadian Business History, the Canadian Business History Association is dedicated to the pursuit of Canadian business history and its role both domestically and in world business history. Our specific aims include encouraging more studies of enterprise by Canadians and in Canada, helping to build and maintain well-structured and open business archives, providing those who study business history a forum for discussing their research with those that practice business, and encouraging research projects on relevant topics. Membership in the association is now open to individuals, firms, and groups. For those on the call today and for those that are viewing our session on YouTube later, I'd strongly encourage you to become a member of the Canadian Business History Association so you can attend more events like these and then also uh, access some of the resources we have and contribute to the community. Today we are hosting an event whose impetus was derived by a Globe and Mail article which took a critical look at the Canadian paper, pulp, and lumber industry. In short, following the recent announcement that Paper Excellence is acquiring Resolute Forest products, we felt the need to bring scholars and investors together to discuss the evolution of pulp, paper, and lumber in Canada. Spoiler alert, while the article took a decidedly depressing view that the Canadian paper, pulp, and lumber industry is lacking domestic investor support, an all too common theme in security in Canada. Today we learned that Canada's forest products industry has a long history of being supported by foreign investment. To start, I'd like to introduce Michael Stam. Michael specializes in media and journalism history and increasingly also focuses on the environment. Michael wrote a book called Dead Tree Media, Manufacturing the Newspaper in 20th Century North America, which does a very elegant job of examining the rise and fall of both the mass circulation printed newspaper and at the same time examines the evolution and then degradation of one of Canada's most important industries, the forest products industry. I should also note that Dead Tree Media was the recipient of the 2019 Canadian Business History Best Book Award. Let me now welcome Michael Stamp. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everybody. Uh, for coming today. Let me get my, my screen shared. Let's see, share screen. Okay. Okay. Everybody can see that okay? Okay. Um, so I'd like to provide a brief introduction uh, about uh, the history of a crucial part of the development of the Canadian forest products industry, and that's the rise of newsprint production in Canada. Uh, this is in keeping with the, with the history, uh, keeping with, lo with long-term developments in Canadian political economy, in which natural materials, previously things like fur and cod, were important commodities of international trade. In the 20th century, newsprint became one of these commodities, uh, and in the case of newsprint, the most important customers for this Canadian for forest product were American newspapers. And in this way, it's a reminder of how important it is to consider Canadian history as part of North American history and as deeply twined with American history. This is an insight that's obvious to many Canadians and mysterious to many Americans. My remarks here are based on my book, Dead Tree Media, and one of my broader aims in this book was to make my American readers aware of this, this long interlinking between the United States and Canada. Since the earliest 20th century, their, or rather our, I'm an American, newspapers were utterly dependent upon Canadian forest products. The Dead Tree Media balances a, a continental perspective on the newsprint trade with a case study of one specific organization initially called the Ontario Paper Company. That firm was created in 1912 as a wholly owned subsidiary of the Chicago Tribune Company, which built a newsprint mill at Thorold, Ontario. That company later in the 1930s built another newsprint mill in Quebec as, part, as well as the company town of Baie-Como. The firm changed its name several times over the years and it was known as among other things, the Quebec North Shore Paper Company as it was on this slide in 1958. I mentioned this as Jeremy's initial call for this panel was based on a Globe and Mail article about Resolute Forest products. In the mid 1990s, after going public, this Chicago Tribune Company Canadian news, newsprint subsidiary was, put, was purchased initially by Donahue Inc. And it was part of several corporate mergers after that, including one that meant today that the company's properties loot. This is the mill pictured here in a 2022 article. Uh, this is the mill that the Chicago Tribune built in the 1930s to make paper for it, itself and its sister publication, the New York Daily News. 
So in this talk, I'll refer to some specifics about this company, uh, and it, this is in the interest of providing some context about the broader trends uh, in the history of Canadian forest products, mostly from about 18, 1880 to about 1950, uh, to give a sense of the industry's important foundations. And much of this is drawn not only from my own book, um, but terrific recent monographs uh, by Mark Kohlberg, by Barry Boothman, uh, and Patrice Dutille and David McKenzie. Uh, these are all terrific works um, that are worth checking out. So on the matter of newsprint, um, how did this the important sector of the Canadian forest products industry develop? How did these, how did we get these supply chains connecting Canadian forests and American newspapers, or these things turning trees to tribunes, as this 1929 article stated? So this was from a combination of resources and politics. Canada had the forests and American publishers wanted the products of those forests, but it was political choices on both sides of the border that created the market for them. The most immediately important origins uh, of these developments came in the late 19th century when wood pulp replaced cotton rags as the dominant source of raw material for making paper. For most of the previous couple of centuries, the primary material for making paper uh, was, was cotton rags, and these were collected in, in, the, in urban areas in the era of the rag picker that one sees in the popular culture of the period. I think Martin will, will talk about this at greater length, and so I won't um, go into that too much here. I'll just simply say in the 1840s, there was a German inventor named Friedrich Keller who developed a way to make pulp out of ground wood, uh, and the first mill in the United States to, be, to begin using this technique uh, was in 1867. Um, this was a huge development for a media culture defined by its cheap products. The penny press of the 1830s was called that because publishers had developed a business model that reduced their product to the lowest currency unit in circulation. And that model was foundational for the media business that has been used since by terrestrial radio and television broadcasting and indeed by today's social media companies. The content is free because business firms were making money for the advertisements. What forest products, in this case the wood pulp to print, offered uh, in the later 19th century was to expand the existing penny press business model by making newspapers even larger, which in practice meant often printing more ads. This is why newspapers got so big in the era of Hearst and Pulitzer. For publishers who had invested in industrial printing plants, the more plentiful, plentiful supplies of paper offered by wood pulp also offered the lure of greater circulation. They could print and sell more larger papers. All they needed, all they needed was access to the right sorts of forest products, which became, in a sense, the, what they needed, the practical necessity for the metaphorical life license to print money. At the time, given existing pulping techniques for newsprint, northern trees like spruce and brucem, excuse me, spruce and balsam were the ideal ones for making newsprint. They did not have the pitch that many southern uh, pine trees did and which made pulping more costly and challenging. And these northern trees were often located in close proximity to rivers, which could be used to transport the logs to the mill and more importantly, generate the hydroelectric power allowing for the cheap pulping of the paper. Uh, on the U.S. side of the border between the, in the 1880s and the 1890s, several, several firms began building mills to make wood pulp newsprint across the Midwest and the Northeast. This was a moment before the United States uh, conservation movement became influential and institutionalized, and one sees these American firms treating their forests in a manner akin to how settler colonials treated the bison on the plains. This was a resource without limits. As, American learns, as Americans learned about the bison, however, there actually were limits. Many paper mills cut through their surrounding stands of pulpwood without properly reforesting. And by the early 1900s, Gifford Pinchot, the head of the US Forest Service, was predicting that many mills would actually run out of raw material in the near future. And this was the subject of a cover story in editor and publisher. This was the leading trade journal uh, for American newspaper uh, publishers. Uh, and they wrote a cover story in 1904, uh, Fear a Paper Famine. Um, in the era of, of Hearst, Pulitzer, and the glory days of the American mass press, wood pulp had become as essential as the internet backbone is today to media companies. What would happen to these publishers, they thought, if, the, if their paper supplies contracted or disappeared? Having been profligate with their own forest resources, this, this then made American publishers turn their attentions north to Canada. Look at all this spruce, many of them thought. What if we could get better access to that? On the northern side of the border, Canadian government officials and paper company managers understood this, and they aimed to, serve, they aimed to secure favorable terms with the Americans in the newsprint trade. And this is a relationship that carries across many industries in Canada. Canada has rich natural resources, but a small domestic market, and thus production for export became the goal. At the time, the newsprint trade was light due to high tariffs. In the United States, the, the, prevail, the Republican Party had been dominant in national politics since the end of the Civil War, and the prevailing doctrine was one of protectionism. But there were changes afoot during the administration of President William Howard Taft, who was in office from 1908 to 1912. 
Starting in 1911, Taft began engaging with Canadian Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier on the possibility of a free trade pact, and representatives of the two countries soon came to a reciprocity agreement that removed duties on many agricultural products. There were hardly any manufactured goods included in this reciprocity agreement, but one was, and it was really important. This was the newsprint paper that the United States publishers coveted. Rather than formalizing recipro reciprocity as a treaty, it was to be implemented by concurrent legislation on either side of the border. Uh, on the US side, Congress readily approved the pact, but it proved much more divisive in Canada. Uh, there were a series of acrimonious debates in parliament throughout the spring and summer of 1911 between the pro-reciprocity liberals and the anti-reciprocity conservatives, and the government was dissolved in 1911. In the September election, Canadian voters recoiled from reciprocity by electing a majority conservative government. This was the end of the term uh, of Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier, but it was reciprocity that was repudiated, uh, according to the Montreal Star. And this is really important. The, the, the forest products industry is really important to this. Um, reciprocity failed for a variety of reasons, and the story is too lengthy to go into here. I, I do highly recommend uh, the book Canada 1911 by David McKenzie and Patrice Dutil uh, on this point. Um, one of the foundational fears that many Canadians had at the time uh, was that a free trade relationship with the United States was a precursor to Canada becoming economically and politically subservient to the United States. For many Canadians, a key group of enemies became the American newspaper publishers, who they thought were trying to steamroll through a trade pact that benefited them at the expense of Canadian forests. It was no accident, many believed, that newsprint was placed on the list of commodities that was to cross the border without a duty. Uh, this is an editorial campaign. This is an editorial comic from right before uh, the Canadian election. And what you see um, from left to right is uh, Canadian, is, excuse me, American President William Howard Taft sort of pulling along a parade. Uh, he is followed by William Fielding, the Liberal Minister of Finance, who, were, who negotiated. Uh, Fielding is the second man, the second one uh, from the right. Uh, and he's followed in the back by the paid reciprocity uh, press in the rear. And the drum blares, uh, it, it blames American publisher William Randolph Hearst for pushing this policy on the Canadian. Uh, the drum labeled Hearst's yellow fanfare is topped with a sign reading, Canadians must vote for reciprocity as I tell them, or it will be worse for them. So when Canadian voters rejected reciprocity, they were rejecting not only what they saw as economic imperialism on the part of Americans, but they were also rejecting an American media and cultural imperialism and specifically America's press barons. Reciprocity's failure didn't deter the American publishers who still coveted the Canadian forests that they needed for paper. Although the broader trade pact failed, policymakers negotiated a loophole that allowed some newsprint to move across the border duty-free under specific conditions. And in 1913, the United States passed the Underwood Tariff, which made all imported Canadian newsprint duty-free. Canada responded by moving, removing export duties on newsprint, and this in effect created an integrated continental economy in the most important raw material for the American newspaper business. So these were policy decisions that kicked off this massive boom in the Canadian forest products industry. And one thing that is, is really important to understand uh, at this point is um, what, that what had been made duty-free, the thing that, that could cross the border without, without a duty, was finished newsprint. Canada wouldn't allow the logs to go without a duty, and it wouldn't allow the pulp to go without a duty. The country wanted the capital investment and the jobs that came with manufacturing plants and didn't want to be treated as a resource colony. So once the conditions uh, for free trade and newsprint were met, that was once the tariffs were removed uh, in, between 1911 and 1913, it took some time for the industry to develop. Building a newsprint Print mill was a significant capital investment, as many were in rather, rather remote areas. Firms often had to build their own hydroelectric generating plants to power the mills. But by the 1920s, this integration had happened. Uh, and the, the, the dam here shown on the slide was one of the two dams built by the Chicago Tribune Company to power, to power its Quebec operations near what became uh, the town of Baie-Como. Um, as often happens with Americans, the promotion of free trade is then followed by a subsequent lament about being dependent upon foreign countries for essential goods. And this was certainly the case with newsprint. The newsprint trail leads straight to the woods, the previously pro-reciprocity trade journal editor and publisher noted in 1920, and those woods were increasingly in Canada. In just 10 years, the magazine lamented, we have driven into Canada two thirds of an industry that in 1910 was wholly our own. Only a third of the newspaper issues in this country last year were printed on the products of our own forests. The once independent American press, so proud and prodigal, is already reduced to dependence upon a neighbor for its very existence. The great voice of freedom that has been heard around the world has become subjective to and can in an instant be silenced by an alien hand. And I think you can actually see vestiges of this in recent American laments uh, about being dependent upon Chinese manufactured semiconductors. 
workers. And you see some of this uh, going on in American policy decisions now, aiming to repatriate semiconductor production. There's multi-billion dollar investments in Ohio and upstate New York, these ex-manufacturing hubs, to do this. And you know, with, with semiconductors being the basis of today's most important contemporary digital media technologies. So um, in many ways, publishers who were worried about, and paper met, publishers who were worried about Canadian newsprint supplies were protesting too much. Newsprint, US, newsprint, U.S. newsprint consumption was going up dramatically while domestic production stagnated. Mill construction began across Canada, including the one at Bay Como. This is another view of the Resolute Mill uh, that was in the La Presse article uh, I showed uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, and Canadian newsprint exports to the U.S. Increase, increased. For many, it looked like a good arrangement. The depression created some major problems in Canada as the decline in newspaper advertising meant that newspapers were using less paper, which meant in turn that they needed to buy less from Canada. Lower production meant uh, that, that there was gonna be excess capacity and there were job losses and a lot of hardship in a lot of these new uh, pulp and paper towns across, uh, across Canada. Um, Barry Boothman's recent book uh, has some terrific material uh, on this period uh, of the industry. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up here uh, with the early 1950s, when prosperity had returned uh, to the Canadian newsprint industry. Uh, and I think there's a couple quick illustrative figures. So one of these uh, is in 1909. Uh, in 1909, uh, this is before free trade uh, policies went into effect, Canadian imports accounted for only a tiny fraction, about 1.7% of overall US newsprint consumption. The overwhelming majority uh, of the paper used in the US to print newspapers was on trees that were cut down in the United States. So 40 years later, so after four decades of free trade in newsprint, Canada had become by far the world's leading producer of newsprint. And in 1950, this is the third row from the bottom, it's 5.28 million tons accounted for some 54% of global production. Uh, it, it, Canada exported 90% of its newsprint production to the United States, where it accounted for 80% of total newsprint consumption. So that's to say 90% of the Canadian production went directly south to the US, uh, and eight out of 10 newspaper pages in the United States in 1950 were printed on paper that had started, uh, that was essentially a Canadian forest product. America, the American newspaper business ran on Canadian forest products. Uh, on the Canadian side of the border, manufacturing newsprint for American newspapers spurred the development of one of the country's leading sectors. With, news, with newspaper as, one, as its primary component, main component, the pulp and paper industries became one of Canada's most important industry industries in the, 19, in the 20th century. By 1950, there are 130 mills located across the country. As the Canadian Pulp and Paper Association described it in 1950, pulp and paper was, quote, not, not only the major, but the fundamental industrial force which has shaped the social and economic development of Canada. No other industry has and has had such far-reaching effects upon the economy. The level of Canadian well-being has been raised by this great industry. The nation has attained a first-rank position in the trading world, owing largely to its activities, and its economic potency has helped bring Canada to nationhood. Altogether, these 130 plants across the nation constitute its largest single industry, Canada's greatest breadwinner, first in employment, first in capital investment invested, first in wages paid, first in value of production, first in export wages. Or as the somewhat less hyperbolic economic historian Hugh Aitken remarked in 1959, manufacture of pulp and paper is today Canada's leading industry, no matter what criterion is used. So I'll stop here. I hope this was useful in providing some of the foundational history uh, of the Canadian forest products industry and showing the place of newspaper within that. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, a, a fascinating introduction to um, the growth and the demand from the U.S. that created an industry in Canada. Um, as you look back at the structure of the industry, do you, is there any particular comp corporate structure that seemed to have a greater advantage? And I guess what I mean there is there were some that were vertically integrated. There were some that were acquiring from third parties. As we think about the 1880s through the 1950s as being like the scarcer period, is there a, a certain corporate structure that made uh, one company advantage to others? It's a it's a tricky one. I mean, I think you know the ten, the tendency became towards over over the longer stretch towards horizontal integration. That is, you wanted to have that economy of of scale, uh, economy of scale and scope in production. I, I think the ones that that I've looked at that tended to seem like they were the most successful at navigating the 20th century were ones that diversified as much as possible and as early as possible. Um, in the case of the company that I looked at, this meant uh, that they got into aluminum production. So they leveraged the fact that they owned 
pretty significant hydroelectric generating capacity in Quebec uh, to partner with a British aluminum company uh, who built a, an, uh, an aluminum smelter in Bay Como, which is still working there to this day. Um, the company then also later got involved in uh, chemical production. They were uh, they, they developed a way of, of making the chemical vanillin out of paper mill waste uh, and so went into the, the um, food flavoring industry for a while. Uh, so you see this also in some companies that operated uh, on the US side of the border. Some companies, uh, International Paper, later became the International Pulp and Power Company. Uh, and Kimberly Clark, there's a great book by Thomas Heinrich and Bob Batchelor about this. When, when Kimberly Clark in the United States uh, was faced with competition from imported newsprint, they realized that they had, they had this expensive capital investment on their hands, this plant. And so what they did was they pivoted away from making, they had, they had a plant and they had forest products. They couldn't compete with the Canadian newsprint. So they started making tissue paper, diapers, and you know, they, essentially they, Kleenex and Kotex then became the major products that came out of this mill. So um, I, I've been really sort of fascinated by um, the diversification efforts by companies in this sector. Sector. And I think one sees actually a lot of innovation in a sector that isn't necessarily one that's known for being as innovative as, as other sort of other businesses in the technology industry or manufacturing sectors. And that's fantastic, Michael. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, I, I feel like we'll be coming back to these themes later in our session. Next, I'd like to welcome Martin Fairbank. Martin obtained a PhD in chemistry and then began his 35 year career in the pulp and paper industry at Abitibi Price one of the many predecessors of Resolute Forest Products. Martin also wrote the book, Resolute Roots, which details the history of Resolute Forest Products. In short, this book takes us back to 1820, when the William Price Company was established to export lumber to Great Britain from Canada. Over the next two centuries, the company evolved into a producer of pulp, paper, and lumber, selling products around the world. The pathway was not a smooth one. The impact of fierce competition, world wars, government regulation, and the emergence of the internet through many challenges at this business. Martin will follow on Michael Stamps Foundation and share the history of Resolute and the strategies the company employed as it worked its way through these various cycles. Martin, welcome. Thank you, Jeremy. So uh, I start my presentation with a picture here from about 1920 of a truck carrying newsprint rolls. And uh, let's look at the timeline of um, technology manufacture. As Michael said before about 1869, all newsprint was made from rags and there were teams of mostly women that were uh, cutting all the buttons and hooks off and then the rags were thrown into a vat and beaten back into cotton fibers to make the paper. Um, as you can see from this ad for, from 1854, the, there was a problem <clears throat> that the, uh, the demand for newsprint exceeded the supply of rags around that time. And so they were looking for another way to make paper. And this uh, advertiser was offering a thousand pound re reward for inventing a cheap substitute for the cotton and linen that they were using at the time. So the answer was to make paper from uh, a mixture of two different types of pulp. One is groundwood pulp, uh, as it sounds like the, the wood was ground, and I'll show you that in a minute. And that gave a smooth surface to the uh, the paper. And then, but it was rather weak, so we had to add this uh, sulfite pulp for strength. So, uh, as Michael said, the first one was about 1867, but it became the default uh, furnish by about 1900. So. Uh, on the left side here, we see uh, four foot logs are delivered into a silo and they're sort of held at the bottom with a net. And then th the ropes are released and the logs spill onto the floor. And all the operators um, had these sticks with hooks on the end and sort of drove the logs into these uh, pockets on the floor, which fed the grindstones uh, by gravity. And a lot of those operators were wearing uh, shin pads and uh, it was uh, joked that they made great hockey players um, and they were probably wearing this, the, the hockey pads on their shins too. Um, here on the right hand side you can see a, a piston that, that is pushing the log onto the grindstone which is inside this uh, steel device here rotating. 
And to understand a bit better what's happening, this is a microscopic view of the wood uh, showing the rings. And the winter wood grows slowly, and so it's they're quite dense, whereas the summer wood grows a lot faster and has much more open fibers. So we're we're looking downwards through the tree here, and the uh, wood fibers are aligned with the height of the tree, and we've chopped them in half for a cross section. Um, what's holding those fibers together is a, a substance called lignin. And then the rest of it is made out of two substances called cellulose and hemicellulose. And when you add sodium sulfite, it dissolves the lignin and the fibers separate easily, uh, making a, a strong pulp. And on the right side here, we see a, a digester, one of these vats where this cooking takes place. And you can see it, it's all steel riveted like the uh, Titanic. It was the uh, about the same period of time. Um, and then a, another chemical pulping process came along. It was invented in 1884. Craft uh, is the German word for strong. Um, and it dissolved not only the lignin, but all of the hemicellulose as well, leaving only the cellulose, which is essentially what cotton is. Uh, there were two problems with the craft pulping process in making newsprint. First of all, it was pretty expensive due to the cost of the chemicals used. and it, at first, all those chemicals ended up in the river. But in the 1930s, uh, the craft recovery cycle was invented, which allows you to burn the organic portion uh, in your recovery boiler and provide most of the energy for the process. And the inorganic chemicals that, that don't burn are recovered and used again. And this was developed by a Canadian, George Tomlinson, and implemented first in Cornwall. The other problem was that the craft pulp was brown, and this is why it was mostly used for brown paper and cardboard at the time. But uh, chlorine bleaching was invented and later chlorine dioxide bleaching, which is a little more environmentally friendly, developed by another Canadian, Howard Rapson at the University of Toronto. So it was approximately 50 years apart that these became the default uh, furnishes from rags to sulfite to craft plus groundwood. Um, but the ultimate dream was to be able to make newsprint from just one type of pulp that was strong enough and smooth enough. And this breakthrough was called thermomechanical pulping, or TMP. Um, it starts with wood chips, and they're passed between two discs that are held very close together. This is a TMP refiner that's opened up, and you can see the hollow shaft on the right-hand side. So you can imagine the chips coming through here, and then... Uh, as the plates are spinning in opposite directions, it gets forced out between them. And uh, what happens is that the, this is pressurized and the, uh, there's so much energy going in there that the 50% water that's in those chips is converted into steam and the lignin softens, which allows you to uh, pull apart the fibers instead of rip them apart as in groundwood. So you end up with something that's a lot stronger. And so it was developed in the late 70s. Uh, it took about 15 years to perfect the technology, but by 1980, um, any new mill that was being built was being built with TMP uh, rather than groundwood and, and chemical pulp. And then another wrinkle came along, recycled content. So in the 1980s, it was all about landfill space that seemed to be running out and of course the the rising cost of landfilling so municipalities started curbside recycling programs so they didn't have to uh, pay as much to landfill this uh, paper and um, they were so successful that by late in that decade the supply of recycled fiber outstripped the market's ability to use it and they were even having to pay producers to take it away so uh, they came up with a political solution. California passed a law requiring 50% of recycled content in any newsprint sold in that state by the year 2000. And several US states followed that example. Uh, and so the engineering firms went and designed all these facilities and they, over a space of about five years, there must've been 10 or 15 recycling plants built across North America. Um, 
at the same time, there was more competition for that fiber because China began importing recycled newspaper print, not only from North America, but from Europe. Because for them, not only did they, did they not have many of their own forests to make paper out of TMP, but uh, they were shipping all these uh, televisions and stereo systems uh, in containers and uh, they had to bring those containers back. So if they could uh, put some other material in there like recycled newsprint, then uh, it, it saved them on the return journey. Um, at the same time, municipalities uh, were spending less on uh, landfilling, but they uh, had to install a lot of infrastructure to collect all this paper. And so uh, somebody said, well, why should we um, collect them separately? Let's just do it in one truck and uh, let the, the people that take the material from us figure out how to separate it again. Um, unfortunately, the separation wasn't a very efficient process. And so the producers making the recycled newsprint ended up with plastic, glass and metal in with their newsprint and their equipment was either damaged or had to run slowly in order to prevent plugging. So um, by that time, by 2000, most uh, recycling mills had to switch to drum pulping. And the way that works is your waste paper goes in with water at the beginning and this slowly rotating drum tumbles the paper until the uh, fibers uh, exit through the holes in the side and the rest of the material, hopefully plastic, glass, and other waste like dead cats falls out the other end. So that's the, the pulp side of uh, newsprint technology. On the paper side, um, to understand paper making, think about uh, clothes washing. Uh, once the clothes are clean, you have three processes. First, you drain the water out by opening the drain at the bottom, and then you have the spin cycle that presses it, and then you have the dryer that evaporates it. And paper is the same. You put the pulp in through the head box, you drain the water off this screen called the Fordrinier table, you press it between two rolls, and then you evaporate by passing it over hot steam rolls. This is what a Fordrinier machine looks like, named after the Fordrinier brothers that patented it in France around 1800. And you can see a sheen of water on the top as it comes out of the head box. Uh, but here there's something we call the dry line where most of the water has gone through now. And the other thing to point out is these uh, blades which go across and under the machine. And they have an effect like a, an airplane wing where they produce a little bit of suction after every blade. So it helps to drain that water out faster. Now, one of the problems as the uh, newspaper industry developed was that they switched from uh, letterpress, which is a stamping process, to offset, which uh, prints on uh, rotary press. And uh, they needed more viscous, thicker inks for the offset process. And it was picking up loose material called lint from the top side of the newsprint. So they couldn't get a very long press run before the print started de deteriorating. So the solution to that was to have a second part of drainage or a, a top wire um, where after the Fordrinier, they could suck water out from the top. And this removed uh, some of the loose fiber from the top as well as created a more uniform sheet because with the Fordrinier, uh, the top side was always rougher. The natural evolution of this was that uh, you could actually get rid of the whole Fordrinier section and just uh, feed the from the head box between two felts and drain from both the top and the bottom right from the beginning. And this is called a gap former. So much simpler and all paper machines are made this way now. So that's the, uh, the technology from the pulp side and the paper side. Uh, it was driven by supply demand by trying to lower the cost by simplicity, uh, sometimes by politics, and also by the demands of the printing technology. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about Resolute, here's my book. Um, and it's really, a like Michael's book, it, Resolute is very representative of the whole North American or world um, uh, of 
newsprint manufacturer. Thank you. Thank you for that, Martin. Uh, a fantastic overview of pulp and paper and uh, how that technology has evolved. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about, so in terms of setting the scene, uh, Michael Stam has done a great job of helping us understand the demand side. You've done a very good job of helping us understand both the technology uh, and its evolution, and then also some of the factors that would have impacted things like supply, like when, when we're adding things like recycled content. Uh, in your book, you speak to a concept of the accordion effect as the industry navigates cycles. Um, do you mind uh, pausing for a moment and just giving us a little bit more insight on, on that concept and, and how it relates to Resolute? Yeah, um, so the, uh, the the market for paper is very cyclical. Uh, you have good times and bad times. And so in the good times, the, the companies have lots of money. And so they go on an acquisition streak uh, or they diversify. Uh, it's, um, it's like the um, seven years of good harvests and seven years of lean that are talked about in the Bible. Um, in the bad times, you sell off these assets and then refocus on your core. So it's been called, it's not me that invented the accordion effect. It's, it's basically this effect that the, the size of the company is moving in and out like the bellows of an accordion. Um, and it's uh, diversification and acquisition is sort of your bank for the lean years. Very good. Thank you for that, Martin. And I, again, I think we'll be coming back to that as we have our discussion uh, after Mike Reed. Um, one other question as we uh, prepare to just understand more about the direction of the industry. So um, Michael Stam helped us understand uh, the pulp and paper industry growing, and then we will learn later about its uh, decline. Are there any products that you would call out today uh, as we look forward that can be important um, in terms of creating new demand for uh, pulp and paper? Well, the industry has has two good things going for it. One is that it's a sustainable product. Trees are essentially uh, a form of solar energy storage because photosynthesis uh, takes CO2 and turns it into cellulose. Um, so as long as you're, you're doing sustainable forestry and replacing uh, the trees that are harvested, uh, you can do that forever. And by the way, any company operating uh, pulp and paper uh, by law in Canada has to replace those trees. Um, the second thing going for it is that um, forest products can actually mitigate climate change. First of all, by substituting for um, fossil fuel products uh, or for uh, products that, that have a lot of footprint. So um, you can burn the, uh, the lignin in your tree and avoid using um, oil or gas. And secondly, you uh, can store carbon in, in uh, wood products. So uh, some of the products that uh, will be in the future stream are uh, mass timber, building 25 story buildings with this. Uh, new wood product um, and of course there's with everybody doing internet shopping uh, and also the disappearance of plastic bags there's a growing market for uh, paper bags and, and boxes and ultimately especially when the fossil fuels really start to run out which it eventually will um, wood can be used as a sort of bio refinery so not only can you make fuels, but you can make chemicals from wood. And there's a lot of research on that. It's not going to happen tomorrow, and it's not going to happen when oil is $60 a barrel, but uh, it will eventually happen. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Martin. Uh, the next speaker I'd like to invite uh, in is Mike Reed. Uh, Mike has been following the pulp and paper and lumber industry as both an investor and a capital market professional for almost 20 years. Mike will give us an update on more recent trends, including the recent Resolute takeout. He will also set the table for a conversation and debate about the future of Canadian pulp paper and the, the greater forest industry. Mike, welcome. There you go, can I mute and uh, let me share my screen.
All right. Well, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, as Jeremy mentioned, my name is Mike Reed. Uh, I'm a private investor. I, I was most recently a portfolio manager at uh, a hedge fund called K2 for over a decade. Um, one sector I did heavily focus on was the paper and force products. Uh, I found it fascinating and, and was drawn to it. But uh, frankly, I think one of, I was one of the few people who did. Uh, the sector and the companies especially are extremely underfollowed. Anecdotally, many companies would say to me during meetings that most of the attendees at the meetings were actually just looking to get a read on commodity prices or, or housing in general, and wouldn't even ask about the companies. Uh, so quickly today, I'll go, go over uh, the current capital public market for the paper and forest product sector, and then look back at the M&A that brought us here. Uh, consolidation has been a hallmark of the industry for the last few decades. Then I'll look at the resolute deal from a capital markets and merger arbitrage angle, and uh, briefly discuss other possible M&A. Um, Looking at the slide here, uh, this is the makeup of the current market. Uh, we've got the majors, West Fraser, Canfor, and Interfor, uh, the major uh, sawmillers, the, the small caps, Western Forest Products, Conifex, and uh, Green First, uh, the new entrant. Uh, the pulp paper and tissue consist of Mercer, Canfor, Pulp, Cascades, and KP Tissue. So uh, we're always asked, why is it ignored by the capital markets? Uh, I think, you know, apart from it being small, small sector in general, there's three reasons. Uh, it's a cyclical industry, as one of the speakers just said. Uh, lumber is especially cyclical. Uh, you know, they have the boom and bust cycles are exaggerated. Uh, that typically turns off investors. And that fact has also led to many bankruptcies in, in the sector. Um, as, as many of us know, paper excellence and resolute both emerge from bankruptcies of Catalyst Paper and Abitibi Bowater, respectively. Um, and finally, the, well, you know, there are just headwinds in general. Uh, paper is in secular, secular decline, uh, newsprint specifically, as well as writing paper. Uh, lumber faces a different headwind. It's, sell, it, it's not itself in secular decline, but there's a situation unique to Western Canada uh, that's been hurting investment. Uh, and, and, and that's over the last 20 years, about 18 million hectares of timberland in BC was infected by the mountain pine beetle. And so uh, those trees have to be harvested quickly or else they rot on the ground. And so super mills were built up in BC by the companies that we all know to, to deal with that excess fiber. But uh, that fiber is now all gone. So it's now, it's in, in retrospect, now there's been overinvestment in BC in the last few years. And you know, that was restricting fiber supply you know, in, in addition to some new government policies. So uh, you know, the, the companies that we know are, have been you know, taking right down Downs and and just because BC is no longer the uh, the low cost region and they've been idling all those all that capacity, you put those together and you're going to see the lack of growth and those headwinds and, and that's not made for an attractive investment uh, investment idea for the paper and forest product sector. Uh, but the companies are aware of the issue. Um, uh, West Fraser uh, recently bought Norward and they they mentioned the motivation was was to expand and, and diversify geographically and expand their products and get a stock listing in the US. And they hope that scale and diversity will uh, give them a less cyclical profile and attract new investors. And quickly on the screen, you can see I, I pulled up an old research report from RBC from 2012, looking back a decade. And frankly, not, not too much has changed. The only most interesting part is that Green First is a new entrant. They, uh, they, built, they bought a sawmill in Kenora, Ontario, and then recently bought uh, Rainier Asset uh, Advanced Eastern Sawmills. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the yellow Resolute RFP and Domtar UFS. Those two are now part of Paper Excellence. Um, and on the bottom, you have Norboard NBD, now part of West Fraser. Tembec, uh, which was uh, purchased by Advanced Rainier Advanced, and Fortress Paper uh, inevitably went bankrupt. Uh, looking just really quickly at, at, at on the asset level, which is more what we see in this industry, the asset level, uh, level acquisition, uh, it's surprising that the, the buyer, for the most part, in Canada have been Canadian companies. Uh, notable, and you know, the sellers have been US or international, if not Canadian. Uh, notable transactions are uh, brass cans purchase of warehousers, Canadian assets in 2005. And of course, like I just said, Green First purchase of Rain Advanced Eastern assets in 2021. The same can be said on the pulp side. Uh, on the right, Kruger Specialty Papers purchase of Domtar Kamloops Mill just recently. Peak Renewable and Mercer acquisition uh, of some pulp mills. 
uh, all repatriated things back to Canadian hands. Uh, just for your interest, some, some, some things about the Resolute deal. Uh, so as, as we know, Paper Excellence agreed to purchase Resolute for $2.7 billion. Uh, the question is, how do you value the $500 million that Resident Resolute has on deposit with the US Trade Department? Uh, the most recent softwood lumber agreement between Canada and the U.S. expired in 2015. The U.S. then began imposing duties on all lumber imported to the U.S. from Canada. This happened in the past, uh, and most recently in 2006, the country agreed to a settlement ending a similar situation. Of the duties that it deposited then, the U.S. returned 80% to the Canadian companies. Um, but this time, without clarity or timing on the potential refunded duties, uh, we have to wonder how paper Excellent and Resolute, we're going to find an understanding of the value of the duties. So there are two transactions in the past that have pegged the value at about 50% of the duties. In 2019, Conifex sold their duties for 42.5%, and the most recent uh, Interfor transaction with EHCOM uh, valued them about 55%. But Resolute came up with a better solution, I think. Uh, the $2.7 $2 billion does not include the $500 million on deposit. Uh, Resolute shareholders will get a CDR, that's a right that, whose value is contingent on the outcome of the duty. A quick calculation, uh, applying the 80% refund will give you a value of about $5.12, and that's on top of the 2050 that you'll receive. Uh, it's of course, well, it's unclear when the new SLA will be agreed upon or how much of the duty will actually be returned, but it's still very interesting. Uh, the other interesting point on, the, on, on Resolute is, uh, given its long, long history, uh, it had a it had a severely underfunded pension of about a billion dollars. It had about three point eight billion in assets and and five billion dollars in, in liabilities. Um, I'm not an accountant, but the underfunding is mostly a function of the return on the assets, the three point eight that they're going to be able to get, and that expected return is based mainly on the ten year treasury. That rate has increased from one point six to four point percent this year alone. That rate could actually mean that the pension is going to be overfunded soon. And that will be a great uh, outcome for, for paper excellence for sure. Uh, and finally, just looking at sort of the, the present and, and future investment, uh, there hasn't been a lot of, uh, of, of new investment in the public companies, but last, last, for the last decade, they haven't needed it. Things were, things were stable, they were on a solid foot, and, and then all of a sudden they got a huge benefit, they got a huge benefit from a, a windfall from COVID related demand. As everyone knows, lumber price went from a peak of about 500 to over 1,500 per thousand board feet. Uh, most quickly, most companies quickly paid off their debts and found themselves overcapitalized. Each of the majors made multiple acquisitions with West Fraser focusing on the US South, KN4 in Alberta, and Interfor in Western Canada with their asset purchase of EACOM timber. Uh, noticeably absent from those investments, any spending in BC. Which, so now that the industry has capitalized, what can we see in the future? Uh, first of all, there's been recent reports that Chronospan, or a family-owned uh, Austrian-based building products uh, company, uh, they acquired a, a stake in West Fraser, and the rumor is that they've been looking to acquire the whole company. Uh, but would the government allow its fiber tenure tenure agreements to transfer to a foreign player? That's unsure. Uh, the windfall have allowed Canfor to pay off of all the debt, all their debt, and they are now in a cash position. And this is actually now their enterprise value is lower than it was when Jim Pattison made his offer in 2019. So the speculation could come for another try. Uh, or perhaps Canfor can use some of the excess cash to buy the 50% of Canfor pulp. That's three pulp mills in, in, in Prince George, uh, BC. Um, however, those mills are suffering from the same fiber supply issues that the lumberers do. And so the question is, does Canfor want to double down on any assets in BC? Uh, finally, Mercer, uh, it's an interesting underfollowed Canadian name. It only does trade in the US, but it is a Canadian company, uh, Mercer International. Uh, my favorite company of mine, uh, uh, it's a, one was a pure play pulp company, but they've recently by diversifying into other, other products, such as the purchase of a cross laminated timber plant in Washington, CLT, which goes along with mass timber, uh, as the other speaker just mentioned. It's a growth area here. It's very popular in, in, in Europe, and I expect to see more investment in it uh, in, in, the US, in the US and Canada. So, you know, in conclusion, uh, while there's, you know, a, a little focus in the sector uh, by the capital markets, the Canadian and lumber and forest products companies are actually in great shape financially. Uh, 
and they're using capital and know-how to expand to other you know to expand to other geographies and products. So happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, one one simple question to just uh, bring us back together. Um, what is the corporate strategy behind Paper Excellence acquiring Resolute? In my mind, it's it's, it's mostly for the pulp and. The, I, th I think they have, they see the writing on the wall. It's very hard to build new pulp assets. Uh, I think the only bear case on the pulp assets would be a large investment in Russia. But I think with, with, with the war that we're seeing, I don't foresee anyone spending three or $4 billion to build any pulp in Russia anytime soon. And uh, you can, if you start losing access to pulp, it can really impact the, 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 the input cost for your, for, for your paper. And so I think Paper Excellence and more specifically Asia Pulp and Paper, who is the owner of Paper Excellence out of Indonesia, they, they know that for the long term, they're gonna have to have secure pulp, uh, pulp supply. Gotcha. And so then when we think about some of the other M&A that you, you think could potentially occur, you have Force Products acquiring lumber, you have like Canfor and Canfor Pulp, and then you have Mercer and Mass Timber. So. It, it all kind of plays along that concept of uh, vertical integration. Is, is that the right way to think about it? I, I think for in most of the guys now have are either looking to expand horizontally or in, into Europe because there's very little left for the Canadian guys to buy in the U.S. So things got too expensive. So they're all diversifying to Europe or the next on the list will be what Mercer's doing, which is, is going down or out of the value chain. I guess there's not much down, so they would have to go up the value chain. And but uh, mass timber, you can see one or two two things happening. You see some buildings coming up, but it does take a long time. It really upends the way things are built. Um, but one day I think we'll get there. It's it's a more efficient way to build, and it's definitely more envir environmentally sustainable than than uh, than steel or, or, or you know the current building products. As we get near the end of our session today. Um, each one of our speakers brings a, a really unique perspective. Martin is an industry insider, um, has worked for Resolute, um, and, and obviously wrote the history of it. Um, Michael comes from outside of Canada. Um, in, in that context, a lot of the funding that built our industry came from the U.S., and then also it, it, it supported a lot of jobs and a lot of capital investment. And, the, and then Mike, as an investor, um, I guess I'd like each of you to share your view on whether we should view Resolute being acquired by Paper Excellence as Canada losing a crown jewel. Um, why don't we start with Mike Reed? Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, it's it's never good to see a foreigner come in and take Canadian assets. I think on on the positive side, listen, it, the Resolute was available for everyone. So anyone could have bought it in the past and there have been no Canadian interest obviously in doing so. Um, but you know, on, on, on the benefit side, the paper and forest products, the assets still remain here. So really what you lose is sort of the mine and management and you lose the profits that will then go back to where they were from, not they won't be staying here. But all the people, all the fiber, all the you know products are, are being exported anyway. That's that, that won't change. And so it's very hard to say we're losing all that much. Apart from some history and uh, which is great, but you know the assets and the people all have to stay here just by the nature of their physicality. That's helpful. Thank you, Mike. Um, Martin, your view. <laughs> well, I, I agree with Mike. I, I don't think. Canada's losing very much. I think the, the bigger difference rather than foreign or domestic ownership is whether it's private or public. Uh, when you're a, a company that's responsible to its shareholders, uh, you tend to be a lot more conservative because they're looking for good quarterly results and they're less concerned about the long-term future. If you look a lot at, at a lot of the European or Scandinavian companies, the uh, both the companies and the shareholders seem to have longer term thinking and they've invested in uh, modern technology and uh, developing the, the, the latest products, whereas the North Americans uh, 
tend to treat their assets as cash cows. Um, so maybe now that it's in private hands, uh, there may be an opportunity to um, do some things that are a little more innovative. Fascinating uh, point, Martin. Thank you for sharing that. And it reminds me a little bit as well of Michael Stamp's point earlier, where he was talking about Kimberly Clark and um, either diversification or, or trying to find new product segments. Um, just very quickly before we uh, go to Michael Stam for the same question, Mike, as an investor, would, would you agree with Martin's view there? Oh, totally. Uh, I mean, you know, you have to, in this business, you guys, they'll be able to say, you have to take a long term because the cycles are so bad, whether they're five or 10 years. And if you over lever on the last cycle, you'll be done very quickly, like we've seen. And that's frankly why no one likes the sector. It's, it, you know, we're in a much better spot now with the ones that we have. And Luck, I think that's mostly a factor of 2008 that anyone who went out of business in 2008, anyone who remained after 2008, obviously was a more conservative management team because anyone la la living through that is better. But in general, yeah, a private company is, is much more able in these really long term, long lived asset businesses. And that's what we see. Most, if not all of you know, the mills that we know uh, that aren't owned by you know, what the big three are private enterprises. And there are some ma major, major, like Tolkien and Hampton, private enterprises, and especially in the US South, most, most of them are private. And Kruger. And Kruger, yeah. Fantastic, thank you, Martin and Mike. Uh, Michael Stam, uh, different perspective on this, uh, given that you're an American sitting outside of Canada and given your research, would love your thoughts. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, one of the interesting things to me also as a historian is just that it's not so much a question of winning and losing as it is it's a new version of an old story in this industry i mean it's 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 you know it's it's often easy to think of it as a domestic industry you walk outside and you see the trees but one of the things about the industry over the last you know over the last century has been how internationally oriented it is in terms of the foreign owners that own the mills whether they're american you know, uh, the Newfoundland pulp and paper industry was, was, was a lot of that was owned by British interests. So there's always been a history of, of mass of extensive foreign ownership in Canada. And then the industry's often been geared toward export, whether they're exporting newsprint to the United States or, you know, um, packaging materials in the 21st century. So I think it's just kind of an indication of, you know, the way, you know, globalization, this version 100 years ago meant North America. And what we're seeing in 2022 is that the paper industry has globalized to include uh, North America, Europe, and Asia. Uh, and this is just sort of the latest version of a long story in the industry. Fascinating. And let's not forget, I, we, are, we are seeing the Canadian majors expanding aggressively into Europe, aggressively into yeah. Scandinavia. They, you know, they are considered the best in the business, and yeah. they are expanding themselves into other areas. So you can ask the ask the Scandinavians how they feel about the Canadian big guys coming and taking their their fiber. We'll see what they say. Yeah. Well, when you say that, Mike, that's that's Canfor in West Fraser. Uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part, Canfor is the biggest in Europe, but that's the only place where they're going to be going now. So we'll see. We'll see more of it. Interesting. On that note, I'd like to thank Martin, Michael, and Mike Reed for their participation today. Uh, very stimulating conversation. I, I think we've all learned a lot. Um, thank you to Canadian Business History Association members and the audience for attending today. Um, for those looking to learn more about the Canadian Business History Association, please feel free to visit our YouTube channel where this will be posted as a recording and also visit our website. Um, and again, um, memberships are available. So we'd strongly encourage uh, firms, um, companies, and individuals to contemplate joining the CPHA so you could be part of more events like this one. Thank you very much, all.